Hi, this is Ivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Listeners, if you enjoy this podcast, I promise you will love my new audiobook for Moms Don't Have Time to a Quarantine Anthology. It's not about the quarantine, but a lot of the essays were written during that time about other things that moms don't have time to do or other busy people, things like reading, eating, working out, breathing, having sex, and 60 best-selling and notable authors wrote essays. All those authors have been on this very podcast. So if you like to listen to my conversations, if you want to get to know these authors better, I read the audiobook myself. Check it out on Audible, Moms Don't Have Time To, a quarantine anthology. Again, Audible, audiobook. Go listen to it. It's like 60 mini podcasts. I hope you enjoy. Joyce Maynard is the author of Count the Waves, a novel. She's also the author of nine previous novels and five books of nonfiction, as well as the syndicated column Domestic Affairs. Her best-selling memoir, At Home in the World, has been translated into 16 languages. Her novels To Die For and Labor Day were both adapted for film. She currently makes her home in New Haven, Connecticut. Welcome, Joyce. Thank you for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Count the Ways and I'm sure so much else. (laughs) So, Joyce, would you mind telling listeners what Count the Ways is about? Oh, (laughs) This really is the book. This is my 10th novel, Zibby. And I, I, I said everything I wanted to say about falling in love and the great dream of making a family and a home. The characters are a pair of young, enormously idealistic artists who meet in the 70s. Same moment, probably not coincidentally, that I made the marriage to the father of my children. And they have three children and they they make this sort of idyllic seeming life on a farm in the country. And they lose sight of each other, as as often happens, especially when you're raising one, two, three children and pulled in many directions. And a terrible tragedy occurs in the family. And I, I won't say what it is. And the, the wife, who is the central character, Eleanor, cannot see her way to forgiving her husband. And they, they break apart. They break apart. So it's the story of a marriage and a family and a divorce and the survivors of that divorce. I, I'll never say that they stop being a family. They're always a family. And that's what I always felt in my own life after my own divorce when my children were quite young. Um, And I think that's an experience that you've known as well. So I really wanted, I had, my marriage ended 30 years ago. My children are are very grown and out in the world. And I wanted, with the distance of time, I wanted to look at what it meant. I wanted to honor that experience. I think so often we focus on the moment when the event occurs. But really, for me, so much of the story lies in how we deal with it after. So it it goes from the novel starts in the late 60s when our character is a teenager, and it goes through 2009 to the wedding of one of the children. Which, by the way, I found so interesting that you had the wedding be a trans character and that Allie, her daughter, became Al. And the way, you know, we don't read about characters who like that so much in fiction and certainly not necessarily from the point of view of the mother. So that I found that super interesting. And, you know, I part of what I wanted to do, Zibi, was not write a book about the experience of, of a child who transitions. I'm That has not been an experience in my own life. I wouldn't feel qualified, but I want to populate my books with characters who have all kinds of situations and stories and not necessarily make the story be about that. So it's not about that. I, 
one of my children had uh, for his best friend in high school, a young woman who ultimately transitioned and became a, a really gloriously healthy and whole and and high functioning great young man now a father of two children so i'm not without some knowledge of this story i wouldn't presume to write about it if i had none and i was i i talked a lot to him and his mother also actually but i just i the the book is full of all the kinds of things that happen over the course of a life. Parents who lose children, parents who drift apart, parents who have affairs with other people, Vietnam vets and opioid addicts. And But it's about all of those things and none of those things. It's really about what we learn over time. I remember somebody saying to me once, if you live long enough, everything happens. <laughs> Actually said it in Yiddish. That's, I, I've lived long enough. <laughs> 67 years old. I was 23 when I married. And I'm still, those years are still very alive for me. I, I feel I have a lot to say to women who are still in it, in that time of life, from the perspective of somebody who was very much there and is now looking so back what, on what should we know? So much falls away. That's one of the things I want to say. I I was, you know, in the days when I was raising my own three children, my daughter was born in 1978 and my youngest son in 84, there was no internet. I published for 10 years a syndicated newspaper column called Domestic Affairs about the life of our family. And it's it's a piece of work I'm really proud of. It wasn't a sort of just cheerful, funny stories about soccer moms and birthday parties. I, I tried to tell some essential truths about family life many of which I've revisited in Count the Ways. But over the course of those years, my marriage fell apart. My marriage ended. And I had to keep telling that story. My mother died during those years. A lot happened. And at the time, I was so raw. I actually stopped writing the column eventually because I, I, I had to be living my life, not writing about my life. But I was definitely angry and bitter and resentful of my children's father in all kinds of ways. And I look back now on that woman and I think she wasted way too much energy being, you know, being regretful about what hadn't worked. So this is very much, Count the Ways is, is very much a novel about forgiveness. And as you might remember, it begins with a Hawaiian prayer that my, my daughter, my oldest child, told me years ago. And she said, you know, if you're ever having difficulty with a person, I'm going to just read it. Yeah, to you. I no, should just know it. I, I have. But she said, say these four lines to the person with whom you're having difficulty in any order. You just have to mean it. And there will be a shift. And the lines are, I'm sorry. I love you. Thank you. Please forgive me. I could not have spoken those words in 1989. I can say them now and I can recognize that I don't just need to forgive. I need to be forgiven. Most of us do. So that's, you know, that's the wisdom of a 67 year old to a, you know, 35 year old, 40 year old, you, you know, you name it. All the young women who were still in the midst of it and couldn't possibly have gotten to that place yet. But it would be my hope that you would, that they would. Um, well, thank you for the advice on behalf of everybody, <laughs> everybody listening. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm not a big advice no, I know, giver. But I, I, you I, know, well, when you said you had a lot to say, I thought I would ask you outright, but of course you do include so much of those insights in the book and in how you tell the story, how you even depict the different generations, the interactions, the regrets, the estrangement, even from the start with the grandmother who doesn't meet, who hadn't met her three-year-old daughter. And of course you're left wondering like, well, why, like what's going on? And you know, this is a story that I think hasn't been told and I'm seeing it more and more. I, one hat I wear is that I, I teach memoir. I mostly write. I've basically had one job for the last 50 years, which is writing books, writing books, essays, articles. But I do once a year teach a memoir workshop, a week-long memoir workshop just for women in which they work with me on the stories of their lives. Women of all different levels, sometimes no previous writing experience. And more and more, I am hearing the story, this is really painful. And I can't say that I'm without some, some personal experience of this too, of people who definitely weren't perfect mothers, but 
mothers who really tried, who did their best, who did all the stuff that, you know, we're told to do, who have become either somewhat or deeply or totally alienated from an adult child, usually a child in their late 20s, 30s. And it's not something that women typically talk about because I think there's a lot of shame about that. What did I do wrong? It's always the mother's fault, isn't it? And I've listening to these women and knowing, as I say, some of the struggles that I've gone through in my life as an as a parent of adult children now and children who were all I'll say survivors of a difficult divorce. I don't know what an easy one is. I I wanted to explore that situation too, among many others. I am the child of divorce, actually, and the grandchild of divorce, and now have been divorced myself. So I'm I'm, (laughs) I'm very well sort of steeped in the divorce rhetoric, if you will, and know some of the the downfalls and you know the the few perks that exist, like having time to read more books. And (laughs) well, you know, the other thing is that. I think, I mean, mothers get it in so many different directions, as you know, but, but because we are responsible supposedly for absolutely everything, you know, if, if our marriage failed, then whatever, whatever bad things are going to happen in our child's life is because of that. And the truth is bad things, difficult things, hard things are going to happen no matter what. A big piece of this story is sort of, you know, the message of I mean, when I say forgiveness, forgive others, forgive yourself. During the years, the period when I was looking at square in the eye of divorce and terrified by what it would do, you know, I would do anything for my children and I couldn't keep my marriage together. You know, what was that? And I would protect them from all these small hurts, you know, a lost Barbie shoe. I'd tear my house apart, which is something that I gave to one of to my main mother character. She her daughter gets a crystal Barbie for her birthday and loses the shoe and the mother just kind of goes crazy. And I couldn't protect them from the worst pain they ever knew as children. During that period, there was a, a very popular best-selling psychologist who was, you know, on Oprah, Phil Donahue, all those shows at the time, who was basically setting forth the view that if you got a divorce, your children's story was written and it wasn't going to be a good one. Not just immediately, but over years and decades. And that, of course, that was terrifying. That was like saying, you know, you're going to give your child cancer. I don't believe it. And when I look at the people that my own three children have become, I I profoundly don't believe it. And I suspect you have some views on that too. Well, I remember, you know, the very moment when my parents told me they were getting a divorce, I was 14, and they started citing all these statistics and that... (laughs) (laughs) That's really helpful. I, I mean, it, they said at the time that they found that children of happy divorces were much more, I can't remember exactly the term, but you're much better off being a child of a happy divorce than a, than a child of an unhappy marriage. Wow. Was that helpful for you? To, <laughs> I still to, remember it. <laughs> you know, I, you probably remember one of the scene that's very important to me in this book is the scene where the parents sit the children down on the couch and say they have something to tell them. And the children think they're going to get baby goats. They, 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 they think they're going to have this wonderful adventure. And I, of course, remember my own true life experience of being the parent who delivered that news. It's, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you're going to throw cold water on their heads, but so much worse. But yeah, they're, they're different people. They're stronger, more resilient people in some ways. And they're just, it's, and, and certainly they're two very distinct things. And one would be raising children in, you know, in a happy, loving household with a partner that you had a really good thing going with. And the other would be the, you know, the alternative of raising children in a household where there was enormous strain and tension and where love was not modeled very well. And when you, you, when you said in the book that you hadn't even noticed not you, sorry, Eleanor had not even noticed that her relationship with Cam had been falling by the wayside, right? It was a side effect of the whole thing. And I think you referenced it a minute ago, but that she was so busy in the, in the chaos, in the day to day that she didn't stop to see what was really lost. And then when you said a minute ago about all the busy work of Barbie shoe, I mean, that's just so classic, right? That we the perfectionism, you sometimes can't perfect a relationship, but you can perfect a playroom, right? You can't protect 
I was, I was a crazy woman who got, you know, who in the middle of the night crept into my children's bedroom to sort the Legos into the bins, you know, the things you can yes. control. And so much is out of your control. Even the giant tree that sort of splits right in the center to like destabilizing the whole landscape, things happen and you can't do anything about them. And so what happens to, I mean, people cope with uncertainty in all these different ways. And I think it's so interesting that you explore in fiction sort of this one particular mom and how she she yeah. deals with it. And oh my gosh, I don't know. <laughs> There's like no right answer. You know, I, I, in many ways, I mean, there were many very hard, sad things that I explored in this book and a few funny ones. There's a, a scene where the woman goes and I... I had a version of this experience too. She's she's alone at Christmas, which I was every other year because you know. And she decides, she chooses that day to go on a blind date, blind first date with a man who is a single father. And she's, of course, she's a person who's desperately trying to reclaim family. And here's this man, he has his own version of this. He's raising two sons alone and she shows up at his apartment on Christmas day with her pie. And he's made this sort of deadly sweet potato marshmallow casserole. And the children are holding, what's that plant where you kiss, you have to kiss under it. Mistletoe. uh, Mistletoe. Mistletoe. And they're holding mistletoe over her head and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go well. It's they're They're not going to go off into the sunset together. I think ultimately what what I came to and what my character comes to is that you, you know, you, you carry on, you make your own new version of family and family can look lots of ways. But Eleanor also had her own trauma with her parents in the car accident, car accident, plane accident, what was it? Something, and she finds out at boarding school and... Yeah. And she, I wanted to explore, I know nothing of this kind of relationship because this was so not me, but, but she is the daughter of two parents who actually were more interested in each yes. other than her. I thought that was interesting too. <laughs> and there, there are families like that. I was too interested in my children probably and lost sight of my marriage. And But she was always the one who was sort of left out. And then suddenly she's, in fact, that's why she wasn't in the car accident. She was left out. I know. I can't even imagine that sort of intensity and feeling like a third wheel in your own home, but then also being so young and being completely abandoned in the world the way that she was and feeling like the people that she would have gone to to deal with the loss were gone. And that was it. I mean, it's hard to, I mean, that alone would have been very successful at addressing her issues had they been there. I, you know, this is, this is my 10th novel and it's, it's my longest novel by far. It's over 400 pages, but I, it's a big, it's the biggest story that I've, that I've ever told. And a lot, a lot happens. I, one of the things that I wanted to do in the book and for roughly, I think probably the, the age and generation of, of these children. So, you know, it might've resonated for you. I hope I wanted to, to set it against the backdrop of so many of the things that happened during those years, not just the big events, but the odd small ones that, that, you know, that were part of our lives and, you know, the toys and the music for sure. It's a book full of the music of various eras and certain events. The, the Challenger disaster actually becomes, as you know, a, a kind of a pivotal moment for the family. It's the moment that not only does the challenger blow up, but so does the couple's marriage. And there is a child who, very much like my own daughter in January of 1986 when it happened, sort of you know pinned these huge dreams on Krista McAuliffe and the you know the reach for the stars and the you know everybody, every child of a certain age in elementary school during those years was sitting in front of the screen at school watching this thing happen. And I'm fascinated, I always have been, by the intersection of the the personal and the global mm-hmm. and and the ways, the, the, the experiences that we all share, but I've shared in our own very particular places, you know. I was homesick that day. I remember seeing it. Oh my gosh. Like it was yesterday. Like I can see where I was, where I was standing. Oh my gosh. Okay. So Joyce, 
50 years of writing books, the only thing you can do. What is the secret here? So when Well, it's not. <laughs> let, wait a second. Give me a break. It's not the only thing. That's I what can you do. said. I would never say that. <laughs> you know, yes. Can I say that? It's it's the it's the it's the thing I can do that people will pay me money. Okay, for. okay. I would I'm never presume to say that. <laughs> I make a fine pie, and I actually increasingly I love to help other women write. But yes, it is it is the one job I've held since I was 14 years old. Actually, I was writing for Seventeen magazine from when I was in junior high. I had the same I, thing, I, by the way. I I published my first essay in Seventeen when I was 14. I know. I read about it. Oh, you did. It. Oh, you're so sweet. 17 was a launching place for lots of people. I think Meg Wallitzer wrote for 17. I Perry Class. I mean, there's a there's a list of, you know, I, and it was, I feel very grateful for, you know, for, for having had that opportunity. I was a small town girl from New Hampshire, and my dream was to get to New York City. And I would ride the bus to New York and meet with my 17 editor and pitch my stories. And sometimes I got the assignment, you know, I would, I think I was 16 when I got the assignment to interview Julie Nixon Eisenhower, daughter of the president then at the White House. And, you know, it was, I, he was not my idea of the president I wanted, but but I was going to the White House and my mother and I got out a pattern and sewed a red, white and blue dress. And, you know, I went to the White House that day. And because of because of the years we're talking about, I was not allowed to ask Julie Nixon Eisenhower about the Vietnam War or impeachment, which was coming. I asked her her favorite recipes. That's what I was supposed to. And increasingly, I was frustrated by that. I wanted to tell more serious stories. And I kind of I outgrew 17 and moved on. But but that was a really important launching place for me. And then how did you go from there to writing 10 novels? And Well, actually, it's kind of a, it is also a story about 17. I, in one of these meetings with my editor, I suggested that I write about the Miss Teenage America pageant. I was myself 17 and they said, oh, well, we would only... And no doubt I wanted to write a kind of catty, you know, sort of cynical piece about the Miss Teenage America. Secretly, I, I would have probably envied those girls, but I was never going to be one. And they said we would only have a story about Miss Teenage America by somebody who was a participant in the pageant, by which they definitely meant like Miss Teenage New Hampshire. But I, I don't know how I did this because I couldn't have talked to a boy at that age, but I called up the pageant offices I got the phone number from information and I called up the pageant offices in Fort Worth, Texas. And I kind of lowered my voice an octave and I said, this is Joyce Maynard with Seventeen Magazine. We, we would like to do a story on your pageant, but I would need to be named a judge of the pageant. And I was. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And once again, my mother took out her sewing machine and remade an old dress of hers from, you know, from the forties. And I flew to Fort Worth and I, and I was a judge and I, I filed my story and I was really proud of this story. And it had all kinds of like sort of a kind of detail that I don't now believe in so much of a bit, you know, making fun of those girls. But it was it was smart new journalism of the time. And they cut out all that stuff and they ran a very bland story. And I was so upset that I took the original version of the story. I was still just 17. And I mailed it to the editor in chief of The New York Times. And I said, I should write for you. And he wrote back and said, yes. <laughs> so I got an assignment to write a story about the only story that I could tell at that point, what it was to grow up and be me in the 1960s. And I filed the story. They said, we'd like to take your picture. They sent a photographer to the Yale campus. I was a freshman. And six weeks later, there I was in full cover, color on the cover of the New York Times Magazine section. An image that if you were older and went, were in an East Coast college in the spring of 1972, you would remember because it was everywhere, this picture. And that, for good or ill, and kind of both, launched my career and launched some difficult personal things in my life and brought about my departure from college. 50 years later, I'm back at college as an undergraduate. I just so read that. I couldn't believe it. And you're back at Yale? That's I'm back at Yale. Oh my gosh. At, but I that was the beginning of my of my publishing life. And I published my first ostensibly memoir the following year, a book called Looking Back, in which I did not mention many of the truest things of my life that I had grown up in an alcoholic family 
that at the time I was writing that book, I was suffering from pretty severe eating disorders, or that I, this youth spokesperson of America, had dropped out of my Ivy League college to move in with a 53-year-old man who happened to be J.D. Salinger. Those were some things I didn't get around to. Salinger had written to me after he, after he saw that article. He sought me out. So that really formed the foundation of my belief in the importance of truth-telling in writing, whether it's memoir or fiction. And it took me years to be myself. That's a loon, incidentally, wow. that you're hearing. You hear that, that sound? It's screaming. It's a loon. It took me 25 years before I could tell the particular true story of what had happened to me when I was 18. But, And that was my memoir, At Home in the World, a much debated and condemned by many books. But it also set me free, telling the truth. And this novel, although it's not memoir, this is my truth. This is my hard truth about, about marriage and about family. And I, you know, my children very often don't read my work and that's really okay. You know, readers can read my work. I'm not looking for my children to be my fans, but, and I don't need them to buy books when I'd actually give them one. But, but I've, I always record my books as an audio book. In fact, this is a good tip for your readers because moms don't have time to read, but they might go to the gym and listen to the audio book. And I have to say, I make a great audio book. I really love <laughs> I love to read out loud to my children, and now I, I love to record my books. So my hope is that they will listen to this book. And if they do, I think it will bring them some comfort and resolution about, about our family. I, they, they maybe don't need comfort anymore. They're okay. But it's a very loving story about actually all the characters. Well, first of all, I have to go back and read at home in the world like immediately. I wish I had read it before we talked and I'm sorry oh, <laughs> that I have I, it. It's a story that, you know, it was such an embattled book at the time. I mean, this was pre me too, but the idea of a woman presuming to say that J.D. Salinger was not, you know, this ultimate hero, spiritual guide, you know, that, that he was a human being, just that, not, uh, you know, I said no terrible things. I simply told my story was regarded as so so completely forbidden. I, you know, I, Maureen Dowd called me a predator for, called the girl a predator for telling the story. And it is, of course, what happens to women. Women get attacked for telling the truth about what men do. Wow. All right. Well, I'm going to get that book immediately. It's so funny too, because in two days, I'm interviewing Joanna Rakoff, who wrote my Salinger year about reading his fan mail. And now here I am talking to you. So, I mean, life is so crazy. But anyway, what a wonderful, rich opportunity you have to speak to this vast array. Yes. No. And I mean, it's for everyone else to listen to, you know, it's like, I'm not like hoarding it. <laughs> what advice would you have for aspiring authors? Oh, gosh. Well, one would be to read, of course, as you know. Interestingly, reading was always a challenge for me. I only learned when I went back to Yale that I have extreme ADHD. So reading is actually really hard for me. But yes, read and be fearless. The most common concern that women have when they come to my writing workshops, and I'll, I'll be teaching one this summer where I know I've already started hearing from women who say, I, you know, I don't know how I could ever tell the story without hurting my mother's feelings, my husband's feelings, my children's feelings, right? Women, men don't raise these issues ever. Men seem, you know, men are just brave if they're telling the truth, but women are the caretakers and the protectors of everybody else. So I would say to women listening to this, there's one thing you may not have freedom in so many other ways. You may not have time, money, space, health, I don't know, but you get to tell your story, your story you own. And if you tell it unblinkingly, honestly, and with compassion, not revenge, which I think I achieved in, in At Home in the World, it's not a bitter book. It's, there are no villains in any of my stories. There are just a lot of flawed human beings. And I'm one of them. If you do that, it will set you free. It will set you free. 
Wow. I love that. Joyce, thank you for this chat. I feel like we're only, we only like skimmed the surface and there was so much more, Oh, but I, there always is. There always there is. Always, I know, I know. And those are the best conversations when you have that feeling. So <laughs> I, I've thoroughly enjoyed this, Debbie. I knew I would actually, I really, I was looking forward to this. Oh, thank you. I was too. <laughs> All right. Well, Thank you so much. And I hope we can stay in touch. And I would love, I would love. Uh, all right. Oh, well, I will talk to you soon. And thank you for this great read. Count the ways. <laughs> Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 